All right, Danielle, let's start with you just as someone who worked in that office. I mean, I tend to think of um, attorney general's offices, uh, or I guess attorneys general offices, as, as largely civil investigations. Um, so what was your reaction when you saw that? What is your understanding of the meaning and implications thereof? I, I think it's a real bombshell. Um, as you say, the sweet spot for the attorney general's office really is in complex uh, frauds on the civil side. So this matter, as we know, has been humming along for well over a year. And it seemed that Tish James was perfectly content to meet with witnesses and interview them, review documents. And that is, is, is chugging along in parallel with a criminal investigation just a few blocks over. And something causes Tish James to say, hold up, this is a problem. I'm moving this over from the civil side of the ledger to the criminal side. So out of her typical comfort zone into a criminal investigation. So I think, you know, from the vantage point of people who have been reviewing the evidence and speaking with the witnesses for a long time now, for them to pick up their heads and say, no, no, this is actually a criminal case, does tell you something about the quality and quantum of evidence that they've amassed over the past many months. I also think it's a bombshell because I think, look, this was a, this was a big move. This was very, this was flashy. Um, and I think it really signals that she thinks not only is this a strong and you know, likely she believes it's a winnable criminal case, but that something's gonna happen relatively soon. And I have a bunch of reasons for saying that, but amongst them, I think her her civil investigation has largely got to be over. Right. Once you attack a criminal investigation, witnesses, of course, are gonna clam up and they're not gonna be that cooperative right. in the civil case. So I think it's, uh, I, I do think it's a, it's a major development uh, in the case against Donald Trump. I mean, David, you know the ins and outs of, of the, the, the org as, as well as anyone outside it, um, or as well as anyone who doesn't have subpoena power, that's something I think you would, <laughs> would love to have and don't. Um, what was your reaction to this? Uh, similar to Donia's, it, it's a big deal because, it, to me, it indicates that the attorney general uh, has not only found uh, evidence of somebody doing something wrong, but there is an element of intent that she's found. That's one thing that we've talked to people about, mm. you know, what does this mean to go from civil to criminal? Often the trigger for the, in cases like this is that they've found evidence that they can tell you what somebody was thinking. Not only did they did something wrong, but they knew it was wrong, and they did it anyway. That doesn't mean that they found evidence that Trump knew, you know, that, that Trump's the person whose intent they've divined, but it could be somebody else in his orbit. And that's a significant step. It's a much higher bar than she would normally have to, to prove uh, or to meet to prove civil claims. Danya, what is, I mean, this is a real Law 101 question, and it's one that I actually still have a hard time with. But when we're talking about this context, like, what's the line between civil and criminal? Like, you can, there, you know, the attorneys general will find, like, civil claims against some business that, like, defrauded millions of people, you know, of $50 million. And it's like, you know, if you did that as a person, you'd be a criminal. <laughs> but you're a corporation, so it's civil. I don't even get where the line is or what it says to you that it might be over that line. I think David could could teach that law in one class. I think it has to do with specific criminal intent. And if she's pursuing, for example, a case against Donald Trump himself, and as David said, we don't know that that's the case. Um, look, there's going to be, let's say, tax returns that he signed. He's going to have any number of defenses against that, including, you know, I had all kinds of professionals around me. I had accountants. I had lawyers right. advising me. Who I didn't know. You know, there are built-in defenses that that go around knowledge. And so you really, to meet that extra bar, you have to show not just that he knowingly signed this, but that he did so knowing it was a fraud. Right. So not just that he was aware he was signing a document, but did so while knowing that he inflated certain assets and deflated up. Yeah, that's, so that's the extra. That's a, that's a really useful and helpful explanation. And and that gets to the, the question, David, for you, when you talk about the Trump org as some entity, I mean, you know, we're not talking about Ford Motor Company or Comcast here in terms of how big this thing is. I mean, this is like it's just a handful of people. It's a really small company, especially at the top, and it's run by people who've been around Trump a long time. It's, I mean, it's not, as you said, it's not 
what you might think of as a large professional organization. It's basically a, a bunch of family members and other people who've been with them for 20 or 30 years. Uh, so the, the circle of people within the company who have been subpoenaed, who've been de deposed, it's a small circle of people. It includes the president's son, Eric, the CFO of the company, Alan Weisselberg, who's sort of, uh, he's called himself the eyes and ears of Trump's finances. It's not that many people. And so I think if you were, that's a good and a bad thing, I think, if you're an investigator. There's a small number of people you need to look at, but you got to flip one of those people. You need to get, if you want to turn somebody, you don't have infinite choices. You have kind of a small number of choices. That's that's a really, really good point, Anya Perry and David Farenthold. That was illuminating. Thank you very, very much.